part of July, make sure I'm on. Around the first part of July, we were discussing in the book of Psalms, and we hit Psalm 97. If you remember, we were talking about uh, Brian and I going out and talking with some members of the Ku Klux Klan about their decision to hold a whites-only rally. Well, that was based out of Psalms 97, talking about uh, the power, talking about the powerful hymn. In verse 2, that declares that righteousness and justice, righteousness and justice, see, these two themes serve as pillars to kind of anchor the foundation of the Lord. And we, we talked about that, you know, sometimes we, we would pick other things, but the psalmist chose to describe God's throne as being held up and anchored and as a foundation with twin pillars of justice and righteousness. What we also talked about in that lesson that it's not just the Lord's throne, but we as his followers are called to champion these things. These are what we're supposed to put into practice. And if we look at the law of Moses, in reality, they're kind of driven by these two themes of justice and righteousness. And so they're, they're held together. And so everything that we're called to do, even looking at the Ten Commandments, is either loving God or loving others. And so, uh, noted theologian Walter Brueggemann asserts that, these, that the twin trajectories of justice and righteousness, that as they're being held in tension with each other, serve as the core affirmations of Yahweh's exclusive claim of the governance of Israel. So that, that's how important these two things are. That is, God's calling a, a holy people to come unto Him these are the two things that are supposed to mark us as a group. So I want us to briefly look at the, these two trajectories. The, the first is aimed at the practice of social justice. Please disregard the whole uh, political realm and, and how that's discussed. The social justice uh, presented predominantly in the book of Deuteronomy. That, that if put into practice and people could see that you're living according to the law of Moses, that the, the children of Israel were going to look vastly different than everyone else around them because the law was set up for a just society. I mean, if you, if you think about it, if your husband or, or father, if you're a young child, passed away prematurely, long before their ages, well, the, the law of, of Moses set in place that you'd be protected as a widow and as an orphan, that, that your community was going to look out for you. If, if some mishap happened, and you accidentally killed someone. Well, you, you couldn't stay there in that community, and, but the law of Moses presented a, 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 an oasis, a place for you to go, a place for you to flee to, where you could seek refuge. If your crops fail, and, and, and we see that, that happening up in the, the Midwest right now with the corn crop going on, if, if that were to happen, they, they didn't have a, a safety net with the government to go in and help them, and there, there was no crop insurance. And so the, sometimes a, a, a farmer would go into great debt. And so if, if that were to take place, well, we talked about uh, that the law of Moses provided that the seventh year, well, those debts would be released. And if things got really bad and you had to give up some family land, remember the year of Jubilee? That, that was what, what year? Do you remember? It was the year 50 after seven sevens, 49 years. Year of Jubilee, all that be returned to you. And so if these practices were put into place, the children of Israel were going to look vastly different because they were a just society, truly a radical community. And so we're, we're seeing how, how all this would be put into to place. And so if they start doing this, what the message that's going to be communicated is these people are serious about taking care of one another. They're even going to put... The, the sanctity of each person and valuing that over the benefit of an economic transaction. What's also going to be communicated, if they're living in this just way, is they're very serious about their relationship with God. This is not just something they're giving lip service to. These folks are sold out on who they are. They're living in this just society. And, and God's more important than anything else. And, you know, we, we're kind of talking about some strengths and, and weaknesses with, within our, our leadership team. And one of the things we're talking about is within our church, we put a premium on being a just people. 
and, and some of the, the core values we talked about last year. We, we really value serving those in need. And I really feel like we're doing a good job of taking care of one another as we live life in community and, and looking out for each other's needs. We, we truly try to do that. And you guys have no idea that there are several people within the congregation that when needs arise, they just come and they'll drop off a check and say, don't tell me this from me. Please go, go help the, the, this family. So a lot of that is, is going on because that's something we value. It's, it's core to who we are as a people. Well, we also balance having a heart of compassion. And this is something this congregation, it, over the past few years, has grown by leaps and bounds. And I appreciate, Ken, you, you talking about the, the work that took place last weekend with folks dropping everything to go down to the, the coast and help the people in Louisiana. And by the way, that, that's going to be taking place over the next few months and years. They still haven't recuperated in New Orleans from everything that took place with Katrina. So please, we need to get ready for that. So we value these things. Having life and community and heart of compassion. Doing what we can. Offering up a cup of cool water in the name of the Lord. But the second trajectory is just as important. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. The second trajectory of God's people is righteousness and holiness. We're called to be equally distinctive. We're supposed to look completely different than the nations around us, so to speak, like Israel was. So it's not just that we socially are doing things that make us a different people. In reality, we have a holiness. And the, the book of Leviticus describes the exclusive and, and pure worship of Yahweh and, and all the ins and outs and, and how it was laid out and, and mapped out for his people. So the one who authored the law given to Moses at Sinai is a God of order. And he says, I'm, I want you to base everything in your society around this. And I want you to put plans in place to where I am at the, the, the center of what's going on. And so we, if we look at the, the Ten Commandments, that we, we have this exclusive and pure worship of God. And so we, we have the God of order that, that says you're supposed to honor your father and mother. Don't kill don't steal from, from your brothers and, and sisters. But he also tells them, you know, don't commit adultery and, and don't even lust after or, or covet your neighbor's wife. He said, we're supposed to be a distinctive people. So if we do these practices and, and, and we, we're going to be a different people, but what the Lord knew is, is if we don't withhold this, what damage it does, not only to a relationship with God, it does damage within your family. It does damage within the community of believers when we are breaking and violating these things. So it brings about chaos in your life and chaos in life of the community. And we, we've definitely seen this, how sin can impact not just your relationship with God, but those around you. So just as the Lord provided for the economically disadvantaged in Deuteronomy, he also puts in place these hedges and these concrete disciplines designed to keep his people honoring him in such a way that we overcome the disorder that's in our lives. But it's more important than just the do's and don'ts. Don't do this, do this. In the law, the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, also counters chaos with order, with symmetry, with coherence and routine. And so when, when they're coming together as a people, they're doing things to counterbalance what the world is trying to do. What Satan is trying to do, Satan tries to tear things down. God wants to build it back up. And he says, so as you come in here together, we refocus and we, we refocus on him, but we also reorder our lives with our priorities. And so these routines are important within the public worship times. And by having the, the tabernacle and, and later the, the temple and at the center, everything was going. The tabernacle, as you can see, is right in the heart uh, of the camp. And so all the tribes built their tents around them to remember this is the tent of meeting. This is where we come together and God comes down to be a part of us. And so we're going to order our tent pegs and where we put this in according to God in his tabernacle. We're going to put him at the center because we want to tabernacle our fellowship with him. That's how important it was. So that's how, how God does this. And so we've, if we look at the book of Leviticus, it kind of lays out some of these consecration laws and things. We have chapters 1 through 7 
that, that prescribed sacrifices and offerings for the people to honor God and to purify themselves. So all that's laid out. Well, that's followed up in, in chapter 8 through 10 where he talks about the priesthood. So he's talking about not only uh, the, the position of that, but some of the ordinances and, and how to uh, set these people apart and, and, and how that they can lead the, the people as God's emissaries. Chapter 11 is food. We're going to be a holy people. We're going to eat differently than those around us. In, in chapters 12 through 15, it's the purification of the body after childbirth and after skin diseases, after you come in contact with mildew and discharges to, to ensure that the people are going to be pure and they're also going to have hygiene before they rejoin the greater community. So this group of people is going to be set apart is going to be different. So God dictates for his people procedures and practices and preventions. And those of you who are reading cover to cover, you're like going, this is kind of monotonous, but it really serves as a playbook to help these people realize we're going to live differently, we're going to act differently, and we're going to worship differently than anyone else around us. And that's going to create this synergy that's going to be attractive unto the nations. That's what God intended. And so all these things have to be maintained and guaranteed. And of particular importance were the holy places that we, that we saw here with, with the tabernacle. And these holy places were, were where an unholy people would come before and, and would enter into fellowship with a holy God. And so you had to have sacred places and, and sacred people that had been set apart for the priesthood to kind of hold hands between God and those that are living the, the common lives. So that's what's, what's taking place here, and this is what, what God is valuing. Okay, well, let's fast forward several hundred years to the story of Ezekiel. For those of you that weren't here last week, we kind of left a picture that Ezekiel goes up, and he's instructed to grab this clay tablet and to draw a picture of Jerusalem. And he's supposed to lay down on his side with this, this picture of Jerusalem next to it, and he's supposed to keep picking up things of sand, kind of putting it up, building it up, building this sea drip, saying, this is what's going to happen. If we keep living the way we're living, this mound, our enemy is going to come, and you're, you're, so, you're so wrapped up in Jerusalem, and that God's holy people in that destination, Jerusalem is going to fall. The temple is going to be no more because of what, how you're living. What were they doing? Well, Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 13 talks about their diet, that the people had started eating defiled foods. You know, we've been doing, uh, some of the staff and stuff have been doing a 17-day diet, doing some different things, and so I've, I've been pretty fastidious, but every once in a while the, the kids will go, is that on your diet? No, it's defiled food. Okay, so that's what these people were, were doing. But also in Ezekiel 34 and verse 25, they're breaking the biggest food law law. They were eating meat that still had blood in it. That's how far they've departed from what God wants them to do. Purification? Well, Ezekiel 5 verse 7 said, not only were they not following the laws and the ordinances laid out by God, they've gone way past that. It said that, that their morality and what they were doing was worse than the pagan people that bordered around them. That's how bad and despicable they had become. What about their worship practices? What well, said the people had set up idols within the temple? can't imagine that's what's going on and instead of sacrificing choice lamb to Yahweh they were sacrificing their sons in the fire to pagan gods that's how far they had departed that's why God has built this siege ramp that's why God says this punishment is coming well, well certainly the the priests were there certainly the these holy people have been set apart they were there to challenge the people they were there to tell them you're not doing right Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 26 says this, Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. They teach that there's no difference between the unclean and the clean. And they shut their eyes to keeping on my Sabbath so that I am profaned among them. This is an important point. Because sometimes we think that when we sin, it's just, well, I, I've got to kind of clear things up with God. We don't realize the horizontal impact 
His sin takes place in our lives. He's saying, you're doing these things. And yes, I'm upset with you, but not just because you're breaking my laws. You are profaning my name. Among who? Well, your fellow believers, for one, but more importantly, the nations that are looking to you. Because you're acting worse than they are. How are they going to be attracted to me? How are they going to even consider turning their life over to me if they're looking at you and you're profaning my name by your actions? That's why it's so important. Nothing was sacred. Nothing was holy. Nothing they were doing was God-honoring. And it was damaging the perception of Yahweh among people that did not know Him. There was not, nothing righteous about them. Nothing ordered. Nothing right. It had kind of turned into free-for-all. And their lives were in complete chaos. And God said, I've got to put a stop to this. So we see Ezekiel gets word in chapter 33 that the word that he had prophesied and that Jeremiah and Isaiah and others had said is going to take place is happening. It's happening. He gets word that Jerusalem had fallen. The temple was destroyed. And you can just imagine those that weren't killed that, that were going to join the other exiles leaving with whatever they could grab and grabbing their, their kids and maybe a loaf of bread and just fleeing. Their whole life that, that they had, had based on the sanctity of Jerusalem and the temple, all that was now gone. And their life is a complete shambles. The people were physically, emotionally, and morally just bankrupt. I mean, they had hit rock bottom. If life for this generation were a car, they'd be going down the road about 70 miles an hour and the transmission drops out. And there's pieces on the highway. If their life were a, a, a box of puzzle pieces, it's just been taken up into a funnel cloud and their, their lives have been scattered to the wind, just like the nation has. The nation is all over the place. All this is happening right now. And there's no way that, that they can pull this thing back together. Only God could pick up the pieces, and he does, starting in chapter 36. So if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me over to Ezekiel chapter 36. And we'll see what happens after the fall. Because God's not going to leave them in this place. Not necessarily for them, but for his name. He's got to rebuild things. So the Lord tells Ezekiel that this sin has been so detrimental and destructive to my people. It's done damage to my name and that can't stand. I've got to fix that. So this is God's plan for the nations that he's got to do through his people, Judah, as he's going to restore them. So he's going to be about this restoration of his children, not because they deserve it, but because his name deserves that. People need to know that I truly am a powerful God. I'm the one and only God, and I'm the only God to turn to. So I've got to do that through my people. Let's read together in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 through 28. For I will take you out of the nations... Where's the nations? Well, they're over in Babylon right now. I will gather you from all the countries, including Israel, that have been taken off into captivity as well. He's going to bring them back together. I will bring you back into your own land. See if this doesn't sound familiar for us. Here's what I'm going to do for my people. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you'll be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols just as we go down into the waters of baptistry. Here's what happens. Here's what's supposed to happen. We give our lives over to the Lord. It, it's, it's not just the waters of baptistry. It, it's forming a new life. This is what God does for us. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new spirit. Life is not going to be the same as, as what it once was. It's going to be completely different. Not based on anything you're doing, but the spirit is doing inside of you. I'm going to remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I, I will put my spirit into you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's what we're doing in response through the power of the spirit. You will live in the land that I gave your forefathers and you will be my people and I will be your God. So their reconciliation is it, it, going to be incredible. It's going to bring about their cleansing. It's going to bring about their, their cleansing from their unrighteousness. 
But the, the text also tells us it's going to change your whole way of living. And in fact, it's going to produce a great harvest. The, the fruit trees are going to start growing again. And, and all of this barren land is going to look different because you're with me, I'm with you, we're in partnership. This restoration has been restored, so life is going to be much different. What a message to people that are in the midst having no homeland, having no place to live in the midst of a famine. He said, all that's going to change when you come back to me. The Lord continues in Ezekiel 36, 35, 33 through 35. On the day that I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate lands will be cultivated instead of lying desolate in the sight of all who pass through it. They've been making fun of, remember those Israelites that were here? <laughs> Look at their land now, okay? They will say, this land that was laid waste, it's become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins are desolate and destroyed. Now they're fortified and inhabited. And so while they're experiencing all these benefits, God reminds them, it's not for you. You guys don't deserve this. This is about me. It's about my name and my testimony going out into the nations. So in verse 36, it says this, Then the nations around you that remain will know that I am the Lord, and I've rebuilt what was destroyed, and I've replanted what was desolate. There's no way you were going to do this on your own. You were captives over in this foreign country. The Lord has spoken, and I will do it. What he's promising is, is, folks, your life is a wreck. Your life is a midst of chaos. You have nothing. You have no assets. You have no place. You have no plan. I have all of that. And your chaos and disorder is going to be replaced by coming back into a right relationship and coming back into an ordered life. And the folks got to be saying, and he's talking with Ezekiel, and Ezekiel's like, these people? You're going to do this around my people? Lord, I've been preaching to them for years. There's hopeless. There's no life in these people. There's no way they're going to change. Lord, you couldn't resuscitate them. They're, the, it's flatlining here. He said, oh, really? Let's go over here. Takes them down into a valley. Where apparently an army had fallen. You've got pieces of bones everywhere. <laughs> it's just out there. He says, you see this? Is this worse than what you're dealing with, Ezekiel? Because th this is what I want to show you. Talk about disorder. The bones weren't even from, I mean, they're all over the place. Look what happens when I take over this. Here's what I want you to preach, Ezekiel. So Ezekiel's like, Okay, you mean when I get back and he goes, no, I, I want you to preach that message. Here's your podium. Go preach to the bones. Uh, are you sure? Yeah, do it. And so he starts speaking the words that the Lord put in his mouth. He starts hearing a rumbling. He starts hearing things go. And what I imagine happening is the bones that have been scattered have got to come back to the same original grouping. And so they're moving their way through, and they're rattling, and they're coming until they form individual skeletons. <laughs> the tibia and the fibia, you know, all that coming back in. And so he sees these things happening. And so you go from a pile to seeing distinctive skeletons. And Ezekiel's like, oh, well, that's pretty cool. He goes, you haven't seen anything. Then the tendons come, and the muscles. And finally the text says, flesh encircled them. But they still lay as corpses on the valley of this floor. So Ezekiel's like, well, what now? He goes, just watch. All of a sudden he starts, wind coming, not from the north only, from the south as well, and from the east and from the west, four corners. The wind is blowing. Ezekiel, what now is going? And this wind goes into the life of these soldiers, and they stand up a new and, and ready army, alive because of what the Lord has done for them. What now? Ezekiel chapter 40 tells us on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year's festival, as they're starting and they're saying, okay, it's a new year. It's going to be a new relationship with God. This is what I want to give you. And so Ezekiel, he, he talks to him in, in chapter 40. He says, I'm going to give you a new temple, one like you've never seen before. 
there's going to be a new priesthood. The descendants of Zadok that, that remained faithful to me, those are the guys that are going to rebirth this priesthood to be totally different in this new temple. And he says, uh, there's also going to be priests who can distinguish between what's holy and what's common, between what's clean and what's unclean. And they're not afraid to preach unto the people what these differences are. They're no longer going to allow the people to kind of muddy things up and do things. No, remember, he's bringing order. He's bringing in structure. He's bringing in a way to where the people can be holy. So it's someone who can do these things. Priests who will keep the laws, reinstate the Sabbath, celebrate the holy days, and stand before the Lord sacrificing the gifts that the people brought. How long has it been since they've done that? All of this to reestablish holy nation, pleasing unto the Lord. Well, at the end of the vision, the Spirit allowed him to see something incredible, something that had been seen by Solomon, had seen by others in the past, Moses. And we have Joshua, and all these people have seen when the Lord came down among his people and filled this temple. Well, no one's seen that for years. They've heard of it. Now Ezekiel has seen it. To have the presence of the Lord, who's been gone for them for so long, is now re-entering. You have the people from the valley of the dry bones have come back to life, and now God is among them in this new temple with a new priesthood and a new holy people. So he sees this thing. Ezekiel 43 and verse 7, it says this, Son of man, this is the place of my throne. This is God speaking. The place for the soles of my feet. This is where I will live among the Israelites forever. The house of Israel will never again defile my holy name, neither nor were their kings by their prostitution, their lifeless idols of the kings at their high places. So this is the vision that he gives to him. He says, this is what I want to do. I don't want to leave you in exile. I want to bring you back. I want you to be my people. Two thoughts for us. Normally I have three, so I'm letting you off easy. The first is, Worship is essential for holiness. If nothing else gets you up next Sunday morning to drag the kids, get them in the car, worship is essential for holiness. Don't, don't, get, don't get me wrong. We, we gather together each week to bring glory to God's name and to lift up praises to Him and honor our Heavenly Father. But something happens to us when we gather in, in this text from this morning, the Lord set up worship times not only to bring glory to his name, but to shape his people, to bring order to their chaotic, chaotic lives. I don't know about you, but I, I mean, Jill and I just, at the end of the day, we're, sometimes kids have to wake us up to put us in bed because we're so chaotic. But there's something about Sundays coming back to reorder us as we come into our worship times. When we take a look at God's word, it reminds us of our call to holiness. It reminds us that, that God has a plan that's vastly different than the agenda and the plans we see out there in, in society that are put forth by the celebrities, that are, that are put into the media, that our kids here in school, they need to be reminded from God's holy word, we're called to be different. We're called to live holy. We come to sing praises to God, love songs to our Father to rekindle that moment when we gave our heart to the Lord. And that's what we come for. We also come to write a check. Why is that important? Number one, it, it helps us, like it did the Israelites back then, to order our finances, to think about things, and to make sure that the thing that we say is most important truly receives our first fruits offering. And number two, it reminds us to think that we're not just building our lives and, and doing the th different things that we're, we're called to do. We also think about kingdom work, not just what's happening here. We're thinking about the eternal, not just the, the daily in and outs of life. We're thinking about it. So when we write that check, we're writing a check thinking about that kingdom work that God wants us to be about. And finally, when we partake of communion, each week, we like the Israelite, we celebrate our Passover lamb. We celebrate the one that not only our forefathers, but each one of us, that blood was put on the, the doorpost to save us from our sins. So we celebrate that as we enter into our time of communion. So when we share of the bread and the wine, what we're doing is we're internalizing that story. We're making it a part of us. 
It's not just something that we do and kind of check off, oh, okay, now we, we can get on the road. We, we, why did they put communion at the end of service? No, it, it's not that. It's taking the story of the cross and putting it inside of us. It's taking that sacrifice and that blood that was shed and making it a part of who we are. It is the sacrifice that makes us holy. It also gives hope. There's new life that can be breathed in us. Worship is a central tool for God's quest in making us holy. But just as worship is essential for holiness, holiness is essential for witness. Holiness is essential for witness. And this is something that's very hard for us to grasp and to really get a hold of. I, th- I think we do better with justice, but not so much emphasizing the righteousness and seeing how important that is. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 23, it says, I will show the holiness of of my great name. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord. How is that going to happen? I'm going to show them the holiness of my great name. Then the nations know that I'm the Lord. How are the nations who have no relationship with God ever going to connect with them? What, what's this? Is he going to do some great miracle? Perhaps. But people are going to take that in different ways. What's his plan? I will show the holiness of my great name. Then the nations know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord. When I show myself holy through you before their eyes. Do you understand how important holiness is? People aren't going to get God unless they see God being lived out in us. Unless they see that we're sold out. This is who we are. We're a holy people. We're different. We act different. We, we go out and we serve. We do different things. But our lives look drastically different around us because of this holy God that's living within us. If you remember the two pillars supporting the throne of God, you've got justice and righteousness. Both are essential. And, and this is something we have to get a hold of. We can't have one without the other. What do you mean? Well, justice is simply, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough for us to change the world around us for us to have life in community, for us to to truly take care of one another and and to have lifelong friendships. I mean, all that stuff is wonderful. But there are people that have found community right down here at airport, the Thirsty Turtle Bar. They have. They go there because it's a place where everyone knows their name. We haven't cornered the market on community. There's all kinds of groups out there where people can connect. We've got to realize that. Heart of compassion? Absolutely. We, we need to be serving. We need to be uh, living our lives in response to what Jesus has done. But what about the civic groups? I mean, you've got the Boy Scouts. Uh, you've got Chamber of Commerce doing some stuff. You've got Shriners. There's all kinds of people. We haven't cornered the market on that. There's no monopoly on having a heart of compassion. You don't have to have Christ to show compassion. They must be paired with righteousness and holy living. For us to be distinctive. Otherwise, we're not going to sit out. We're not going to stand out. We're not going to have a witness. The Lord shares with Ezekiel, the nations will see God's holiness through us. So we are to be the Lord's holy priesthood, walking in the Spirit and encountering people. People come in, uh, there's something different about you. Yeah, let me tell you what it is. This is how my life has changed because of what Jesus Christ has done on my behalf. So are we doing that? Do our lives look different than the people around us? Are are we truly holy or are we common? Can you pick us out from a crowd? The way we do business, is it different than the way other people do business? I know some businessmen here. The answer to that is yes. They make some decisions that financially make no sense. Uh, People they hire, why would you? Well, they, they need help. Okay, and, and I can write the check and afford to do that. That happens all the time. You've got to make sure that in your line of work, you're standing out from those that are doing business practice differently, even if it costs you financially. Is there a difference between the way you treat your family and the folks next door? I, I, I sure hope so. Is there a difference in how we're living? You know, without holiness, our witness is diminished. You know, there's a lot of discussion going on within different circles about why the the church big c is is diminishing 
and why we're barely holding 50%. And I'm not talking about just Church of Christ. I'm talking about all of Christendom. Why are we only holding 50%? And a lot of people are, are talking about, well, well the, the church just needs to be more relevant or it needs to do this, it needs to do that. I, I really feel like the reason the church is struggling is, in a lot of ways, we've, we've diminished holiness and we've diminished our distinctiveness. And so the generations that are coming up are like going, uh, my dad's not a whole lot different than his dad, and then his dad didn't go to church at all. Okay, if, if, if we're not distinctive, if, if our kids can't see that, that we're serious about this, that the love of Christ has changed us, why bother? Why show up? Why give up my Sunday? Why write the check? Why do anything when my, my friend over there, they're, they're going down to the river. I, I'd rather go down to the river if this isn't going to change our family and how mom and dad interact and, and how our family is, is, is doing family. If there's no difference, why are we going through the motions? And so a lot of folks are saying, it's not worth it. When I get out here, when I graduate and I leave, that's the last time I'll enter a church. That's what's happening. We've got to be a distinctive and holy community. Because if our kids walk in and see us praying, if our kids walk in, we're reading the Word, and it's not something forced or contrived. We're modeling for them. Doesn't it make sense? They're like, well, if mom and dad see value in this, I, I, I'm going to at least try it. If, if mom and dad said, uh, we're not going to have the discussion every Saturday night. Are we going tomorrow or are we not? No, we, we go, and if, if you've got 100 fever or below, you're still going to go, you know, and we'll get everyone else sick, but we're going to be there, you know. If that's not an option, don't you think when they go off to college that it, it would feel odd not to find a worship community? Because that's what I've always done. But if this is just something you kind of do from time to time, they're like going, why? We've got to model what's of crucial importance if we're modeling discretion in our entertainment, if, if our language is vastly different than what they hear at school, perhaps they'll follow our lead. If, we, if they see how we treat people is different, that holiness gets passed down from generation to generation. If we're generous with our blessings and, and how God has done that, and we give that back to him, it speaks volumes to them. Our kids know whether we're giving or whether we're not. It's so much more effective a, a, a witness we're modeling these things then then having that conversation as you're driving down the road saying well uh, uh son i i've made a lot of uh, mistakes and but that's not what i want you to do i want you to uh well do the things that you don't see me doing because your mother thinks it's important does that work we've got to take this serious we've got to model for our children and for our co-workers and others that this is crucial it changes us We've got to realize how important this is. You know, I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip several years ago up to Clearfield, uh, Pennsylvania. And we went up there and we're taking a mission trip group. And I, I was in the youth group at the time. And we showed up on a Sunday morning and it was a complete disaster. It turned out that uh, the, the deacon, there was a smaller church, but the deacon in charge of, of taking care of things had gone to fill up the baptistry and had put a hose in there on Friday afternoon, forgot about it. And so all Friday night, all day Saturday and early Sunday morning, this water is pouring over. It's going throughout the whole church. And they had tile floors, so it just needed to go even that further. And, so they, and they went up into the sheetrock. You could see the discoloration huge mess the preacher knew he was in trouble he said he told us out in the parking lot because we came up he could see this stream coming out the front door leading out and so he knew that he was in trouble literally you no know, this was a biblical thing that took place the the final vision that ezekiel gets is found in chapter 47 i'll make it quick he said in this new temple there's going to be a river of life-giving water that's going to pour out from the threshold of the temple. And it's going to go out over the stage, outside, and into the parking lot. It's going to keep going. It's going to go through the, if you've ever been over to Israel, I'm telling you, it's not a garden oasis. And you go out, I really don't know why they're fighting over that land. But man, it, it, you go out, it's just desolate out there. And as you're heading towards the Dead Sea, it gets worse. Nothing's growing out around there. And so you're driving through all this just brown sea of brown then you see the lowest place on the entire planet they call it the the dead sea or the sea of salt nothing grows in it 
it would be very difficult to drown in the, the Dead Sea because the salt content is off the chart. You can actually go read a paper reclining as if you're on a floaty because there's so much sediment and stuff in there. But because of that, there's not fish one. There's no wildlife. Nothing grows around it or in it. You're just in this sea of soup, and it feels kind of gross when you're in it, but it's kind of cool to experience it. What he tells him is, is this sea of life, this river is going to flow out from the temple. It's going to go down through the valley, make its way to here. He said, Ezekiel, this is how powerful your witness is if I'm living in your life. He said, all along, it's going to change like a Disney film. Stuff starts growing, and you see blossoms coming up. He said, there are going to be fishermen. They're going to be fishing the salt sea. No. Yes. That's how powerful it is. This is a vision. Of course, he's talking about the call of us to take our experience with the Holy God, allow that to filtrate out. I want the holiness of God and what we've experienced here in worship to overflow into our schools. Our schools need some holy kids. They do. Some people that are going to be not just good kids, but vocal. Because right now, the ones that are vocal are ones that, that are causing a lot of trouble. Yeah, I've talked with you guys about that. But we need some folks that are, that are going into our neighborhoods and are being a voice of, of holiness and what's right and making decisions and caring for others. We also need some holiness to make its way into the marketplace. So as we lead sanctuary today, may we be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy.